So I will talk about decentralized management of uh, digital objects um, for science. And although I'm giving the talk, what I will present is not uh, my own work or not solely my own work, uh, but you'll see the, the essentially the works of uh, five core developers and a dedicated uh, documentation project team. And given that we've heard how important funding and networking is, uh, I'm happy to say that we're funded and networked. So that uh, should give you an uh, indication of the, the likelihood of survival um, for the immediate future. So I'll be talking about a tool called DataLed, and it's for joint management of data code uh, uh, through their entire uh, life cycle. So that includes version control, uh, getting data from A to B. Uh, it's a free and open source software written in Python, MIT licensed. Um, so it has a Python API and a command line interface and, and so on. And instead of you know, giving you a lengthy explanation of, of you know, what this really means and what the details are, uh, given that this is a developer meeting, I anticipate the question, uh, sounds like Git, why not use Git? And uh, I can tell you that a data data set, which is the core data structure uh, that the data software uses to handle everything, um, is actually a Git repository. So everything you're seeing uh, feature-wise sits on top of a very mature, let's call it industry-grade uh, base of tooling. There are a few principles uh, that we follow in the development of DataLed that try to make sure that we don't ruin the, the features and, and possibilities that, uh, that the tool like Git gives us. So for example, uh, DataLed only recognizes two entities in the world, ones are you know, files, we all know them, and datasets, which are collections of files. And there's, there's no other you know, domain-specific uh, specialization uh, in there. We try to minimize uh, custom procedures and, and, and routines that uh, are necessary. So if Git provides us a feature um, to implement a solution for a given problem, then we will do that with the aim that if DataLed, being a somewhat academic uh, development project, happens to die, that its users will not unnecessarily suffer from that death, but they can continue uh, with you know the, the mature base still being intact. And I think we can agree that if Git will vanish, something will, de will, will be developed that allows us, uh, allows us to transition to it. And we also try very hard to not uh, compromise the complete decentralization that uh, Git allows us, so no mandatory uh, services. Um, and if you've worked with Git and you try to put lots of data into Git, you'll know that Git doesn't handle large files very well. Uh, quick question to the room, who knows about, or who has heard about Git Annex? So quite a few people. Uh, Git Annex is the tool that we use in DataLed in order to uh, manage large files. So instead of managing, putting the content into a version control, we only put information about its location and identity uh, into, into Git, which makes uh, a lot of things uh, 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 much more easy. And Git Annex, uh, for those uh, who don't know it, but know uh, Git large file uh, support, is the, from our perspective, and given the principles that I mentioned, the superior alternative because it's a completely decentralized solution. So every, everything that you can do uh, with Git for code, you can do with Git Annex plus Git for large files, which is very nice. And the purpose of DataLed here is to make, well, for those who know Git Annex, uh, the, the, the actual use inside it uh, to uh, transparent to, to a certain degree. So, uh, when I just said that we are basically using Git and Git Annex and um, everything that we want to do can be done with them, why uh, is there a need for a dedicated software that sits on top of it? And there's a, there's a single most important reason, there are other reasons, but one is most important, uh, and that is a single repository is, is, is typically not enough for many of the workflows uh, that we need, particularly in science. And uh, there are technical reasons for that. For example, if you try to put a million files into Git repository or try to do 100,000 commits, you will quickly see the end of the system. And the, uh, there, there are other uh, application-based issues. For example, if you have different uh, bits of information that are uh, targeting different audiences with different access permissions and so on, it gets very complicated, even on a technical level, to make that happen if you're, if you're stuck with a single uh, repository. And there are other reasons. Uh, I could go on uh, about this uh, quite a while. So uh, in science, we essentially only have what I would call modular data management uh, um, uh, issues, uh, in particular uh, in, in collaborative environments. So if we look at 
uh, a, a, a typical signs uh, workflow, then we're, we're talking about the combination of individual pieces that have been developed in the past into something that produces novel results, which will then be published in, in one way or another. Right? So in more abstract terms, we're talking about aggregation of works across time and also different uh, collaborators or con on, uh, contributors. So mapping these onto uh, dedicated repositories, it feels kind of natural, right? So you develop a library, you have a, a source code repository for it, you have a data catalog, you have a, you know, some sort of data set for that, right? So these modular uh, environments are, are kind of natural to the thing uh, that we do. Now, what I want to show you now is a lot of code that just runs through and just gives you a, a more or less visceral uh, demonstration how, how that feels like if you do it with Git and Git Annex natively. So I'll just click the play button. It's not necessary that you, you know, read all the lines. What's happening here is basically assembling in Git usage the picture that we've just seen. So there's a student that created a repository uh, for code. There's another student that collected some data, put it into another repository. And now there's a postdoc that creates another repository that uses Git submodule mechanism to combine these um, repositories into a uh, third repository that then will track analysis results that have been derived uh, from the combination of um, the, the, the data or the application of some novel analysis algorithm uh, to these data. So that could be a situation that has happened in the past. It's the, the situation in, in some lab. And now the PI comes uh, after a while and um, writes up a paper about this. So how does it look like if we have another Git repository that tries to you know, contain the manuscript, which then you know, somewhat you know, comprehensively tracks all the inputs. So how does it look like? So we start with the repository, gets created, uh, and then we put in the entire study repository as a Git Annex infused repository. And the PI needs to remember that this one needs to be initialized. So he needs to look at, you know, what the branches are that are available. And then we need to init that one. And of course, uh, at this point we are ready. So we can use Git, annex, uh, Git again to assemble the entire work tree, which clones all the repositories. We have a nice project-based directory that contains the data, the code, everything that's necessary. Really nice for reproducibility, excellent. But the PI finds a code, uh, a bug in the code. It happens, right? So it tries to apply the fix to the code repository because the postdoc is not there to do it uh, for the PI. So it, it, it goes right in there. So it's a decentralized system, right? Should be no problem to just do it in any random clone. Uh, and then tries to just git add the code. And then the problems start in this, in this scenario. So git uh, does not really well or um, makes the usage of those submodule mechanisms really easy. So we have to remember if we want to commit something to the code repository, then we have to remember where's the code repository, go into the code repository and then commit it there. But given that it's a uh, submodule, we will discover that Git uses what's called detached head. So if you commit something to that, we'll later on discover that we cannot publish it back to the original repository. It all becomes uh, a nightmare. And in the end, we have to go up the hierarchy and commit all the changes in order to have a, an orderly, clean repository uh, at the very end. And of course, this can all be done, uh, but it's very complicated and tends uh, to be used as an argument why you, we wouldn't want to use that kind of machinery in typical uh, science workflows. And then there are little uh, bits and pieces. We can, we can use Git Annex to, uh, to obtain the data. That's what it's written for. But again, Git Annex focused on a single repository. So it won't, it won't give us the data we need unless we go back to the repository that actually contains the data and then discover it. You know, it knows where, how to get it from, fulfills the file handle and so on. We have the data, all the situation that we wanted. Everything is good. And at the end of the project, the problems are still not done because we can't just use a system call to remove the project because Git Annex uses special tricks and pieces to protect us from data loss, which then turn out to be uh, um, involve required knowledge that we need to give it back permissions and so on. So, and you can imagine uh, how that would feel like for a person who doesn't do that full time, right? So all the information is lost all the time, needs to be rediscovered all the time. It's a big hassle and, and causes complications. So for the rest of the, the demonstration, we'll just do the PI part again. 
and use data led so you can you can see how it's different we use the exact same pieces as input that were produced by the students and the, the postdoc to provide the the building blocks uh, for the paper but we'll now use just uh, um, data led commands so we can create a data set which is create a git repository simply by using create that's all you need to remember we can clone any other data set at any place in any other data set and make it a sub data set that uses the submodule mechanism we don't see it yet all the setup that is necessary is done inside we can um, ask for any piece in the super data set simply using the get uh, uh, command that will automatically obtain all the intermediate repositories that might be necessary in order to fulfill a, uh, a request to a particular data file or code file all happens automatically there is no need for specific uh, reinitialization and the great thing is that if we actually work with these hierarchies um, data led will feel will make this hierarchy of nested repositories actually feel like a single monorepo so we can do uh, things like status requests and it will tell us not only that the top level sub data set or sub module is modified but give us an actual indication what is the situation all the way down and because it can do that it can also apply uh, modifications really quickly so we can we can just say save me this entire thing and it will make sure that the actual change is committed to the repository that contains the change and all the repositories upstairs know that there was a change that was caused by this thing and applies the commit messages all the way up so we have a clean hierarchy uh, at the at the very top so that's my idea of an of a, of a demonstration um, how you know why data led is particularly suited more suited than um, than git and git annex uh, on their own for these modular uh, workflows so uh, the situation if we if we continue this line of thought is that we can essentially map all those modular uh, uh, problems where we have data that comes from you know different entities is maintained at a different pace evolves at a different pace has different access permissions etc that we still want to combine to produce scientific results in a very you know identifiable and accountable way we can map onto these uh, uh, technological uh, pieces and you can use the same kind of idea in many contexts right so it doesn't have to be science it could also be for example uh, the, the, the scenario of a continuous integration system where you have a repository of data maybe that was the output of a scientific study right but you want to use it in context of continuous integration so you use it as a dependency to a software package and the the, the sub data set doesn't need to be polluted with the idea that it's now being used inside a continuous integration system so you can flexibly reuse components of data or code in in whatever uh, uh, system you're you're trying to build and oops and the uh the point i want to make is that this um, model actually scales quite far so if you go to uh, uh, this page on GitHub, you can actually uh, data let clone a repository that tracks 15 million files and 80 terabytes of data, where the actual sub data sets, four and a half thousand of them, don't even live on GitHub, nor does the data. And for data let, it just feels like clone this thing, get me that file, and it figures it all out internally, giving you have access permissions, and the README tells you how to get that. So it's, it, it can extend uh, quite far into the uh, um, into the you know complexity that we often face in in, in scientific scenarios um, another key bit that is missing in 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 most cases uh, most version control systems is that we typically don't know what the cause for a change was right so we if we if we modify a file uh, in uh, in some code base then we have to be uh, disciplined and amended with an appropriate commit message in order to you know transmit the message of what the cause for that change was to the past right if we run any sort of tools in in scientific data processing that step is typically not captured right we have input data then some script is applied with some parameters to produce output data but not necessarily is the is that parameterization or how exactly the script was called uh, uh, recorded which is a huge problem for reproducibility of, 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 of scientific results right because at the point where you want to reproduce the person who's done it is usually no longer accessible and everything is a big question mark so in data light, thank you in data light, we can uh, we can use the machinery that I've just shown you that it can basically 
uh, analyze and 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 commit arbitrarily complex trees of you know connected or nested modular units um, to very simply capture pretty much arbitrary modifications of any uh, data set. We only thing that we need to do, and DataLed provides a tool called Run, is we just wrap the execution of an arbitrary command line with DataLed, and DataLed does nothing but checking that a working tree is clean, however complex, runs the tool, checks what the modifications are, and then pro makes a commit message that amends that mod recorded modification with information about what tool was run in which way, and puts it in a commit message, like we would do with a manual edit uh, in, a, in a code base. And now I hear some of you saying, yeah, but you know, if you can, can compute it on one system, uh, that doesn't mean you can compute it on another system, so lots of information is still missing. But uh, we all know that there's technology like uh, containers, right? So uh, lots of uh, you know, uh, scientific institutions are capable of running things like Singularity, right? A Singularity container is just a file. This system is built for tracking files of arbitrary size, right? So you just put your container in there, it's tracked like any other piece uh, that you use, and uh, Daylight provides a specific extension to make use of those containers. So you run the same execution, and Daylight performs the exact same thing, make sure it's clean, apply it, record the change, amend the, commis uh, the commit message, but the execution actually runs in the container that the data set also contains. So you, you pretty much have achieved uh, comprehensive provenance tracking, although you don't know, still don't know what exactly happened inside that execution, but you know which execution it was, and you could do forensics uh, later on, which is much more uh, than one normally is able to do. Um, and the last point I want to make in the, in the, in the, in the, in the remaining minutes is uh, that we've heard about the necessity for metadata uh, repeatedly. And especially if we're going you know, to heterogeneous data collections, large data collections, stuff that we cannot you know, um, humanely process, I would, uh, I would say. It's, it's an issue how we deal with metadata. And metadata, uh, how we describe data, is an, is an active field of research for decades and has the problem of you know, not really delivering the great results uh, you know, that justify all the effort that went into it. And that's because these standards change all the time and we need to somehow automate these, uh, these issues in order to be able to track uh, the developments that are done uh, on the uh, metadata description uh, research and apply them to the to the vast amount of data that uh, that is being processed and, and and generated. So in DataLed, just to register the thought, there is this idea that metadata is programmatically extracted from data, and multiple representations of the same information can live in parallel next to each other. So we can use a metadata standard that exists today and transition to a new one once it's available and have that transition be machine aided so it's quickly, uh, it, it, it can be done with justifiable uh, effort. And DataLed's purpose here is not to be a comprehensive description engine. The description is the duty of the specific uh, domains of application that know how data needs to be described. The purpose of DataLed here is that you can provide a little script that tells DataLed, here is the metadata that I you know, learned about this data set and it takes care of uh, handling it, of storing it in a, in, a, in a standardized format, also being able to detach it from a data set in order to be able to put it into databases to enable uh, queries and search and, 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 and so on. So to summarize, DataLed is a tool that makes the combination of Git and Git Annex for decentralized data management much more convenient and simpler for many uh, scientific workflows where we're not necessarily being interested in making every scientist a software developer and cannot afford it. And uh, it has, it aids uh, provenance capture and discoverability through uh, support of metadata. And there is, it can do much more than I was able to, uh, uh, to present today. And if you want to find out more, uh, you can go to handbook.data.org and get a fairly comprehensive view of what it can do both from the basics of you know why is version control important for for science and for other applications but also for specialized uh, use cases uh, that uh, shed light on problems like how to uh, construct a scalable data store or how to write a reproducible paper for for science using uh, this type of tooling and with that uh, i thank you and we're also hiring not just in, in not just in germany but also in the us so whatever you prefer uh, get in touch please thank you
Thank you. Thank you. That was not a question, but I would like to repeat that. <laughs> he, he has talked to, uh, to uh, the core devs for, for years, but until the talk, he, uh, he never understood what, what it meant. <laughs> Right. So, so question one was whether we are uh, employing WC3 uh, prof standard for provenance capture. And uh, the, the two-stage answer, one is data light doesn't care what we support. It just accepts you know, a structured report of whatever structure. And if that's crappy, then it will be crappy, but it will be managed. If it's good, like WC3 prof, which data light's own metadata extractors internally use, yes, uh, then it will be more usable. But there is no requirement that the metadata, your first attempt at metadata needs to be perfect or standardized or signed off by some entity. You can do whatever you want if you think that's useful. And the second question was whether we push containers using some standardized mechanism to some kind of archive or catalog. Uh, yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's nothing in Datalet that does that. But, but for us, again, Datalet knows files and data sets. So a container is a file. Uh, it, you can, you, Datalet has an extension mechanism where it would be very simple. There's a template you can clone from, from GitHub where you could, uh, you could add subcommands to Datalet that, for example, would say, OK, list me all the containers uh, that it knows in this data set and then you know, give them a you know, unique identifier and push them somewhere. But there's no built-in support in data light core for that. Yeah, this is a very fundamental question. Um, the computer scientists I work with are very um, reluctant to put data under Git um, because source code um, version control is based on graph theory. And uh, revision histories for data would be better supported by category theory. Output transcript Out there for access to the So, the question was whether, uh, I'll paraphrase it uh, if you excuse me. The, the question was whether Git's way of identifying information is sufficient for scientific data and whether we should switch to something that is based on a different theory. Is that fair? And, and so, the, um, I can tell you I've never thought about that. Because uh, the, this whole uh, project is about practicality, right? So we are sitting on top of Git, not because we like its theoretical implications, but because it's a widely adopted platform that we still have to discover the, the limitations for the work that, that we've been doing, right? And likewise for Git Annex, right? It interfaces with the storage infrastructure that the planet has right now, right? So, so that's why we're doing it. Uh, if this turns out to be a problem, I'm sure it turns out to be a problem not within the scope of data led, but within the scope of you know, tracking information or identifying information in general. And then I'm sure we'll jump on the train wherever it goes, when it goes. <laughs> Thank you. I know. Yes. So my question was, how does a data lab manage the transfer of file? When, when I clone the 80 terabyte, suppose this, if I have the space, mm -hmm. put it somewhere, how does it work, yeah. the transfer? And can you comment uh, on the, this bit, that project, if it's such a technology that you could integrate in data lab? Right. So um, in, in data lab, we don't even, we, we don't make that decision, right? In data lab, it's Git Annex that is responsible for, for data transport. So Git Annex, for example, can use torrents for data transport. It can use IPFS for data transport. It can use all kinds of stuff, right? If your data is on Amazon's big 
hard drive, you don't care, right? And it can use that too, right? So we, we, we're not, you are not making a decision for a particular single technology because in our experience, there is no single technology that serves all the use cases, right? And, and that's why that is Git Annex's domain and it does that really well. So in, in, in that, is, they make different choices and they, they have a more you know, stringent you know, set of technologies uh, that they choose for reasons that are valid. And, and there's no, it's, it's not that, you know, we, we can, you can do similar things in Daylight plus its, uh, its, its foundation. There is no uh, you know, direct conflict of, of any sorts. Okay. Sorry. Thank you.